Hey guys, welcome back to another video. My name's Maggie. I was a professional MCAT tutor and now I'm in medical school. Me and my brother John run this channel to teach the MCAT sciences and such to you guys for free. And today we're going to be adding on to our high yield series, which is where we kind of go into like the high yield sciences on the MCAT, just tell you what you need to know to score well on the MCAT and nothing else. So today we're going to be going over separation techniques as well as lab techniques. And this series of us doing high yield videos on, on our YouTube parallels our ebook, our high yield ebook, which is available on our website for purchase. And the chapter in which I'm getting all this separation techniques stuff from is called separation techniques, lab techniques, and research methods, but that's kind of like a lot. I already have a video up on research methods and like the common ways in which the MCAT tests your knowledge of research methods. So go give that a watch for sure, but I'm happy to do another video on research methods. If you guys want, just leave a comment below. So today we're going to be going over the separation and lab techniques, and there's a lot of them, and I'm not sure I'm going to get to all of them today, but if I don't, then I'll probably make a different video on like chromatographies later. For completeness sake, I've listed like pretty much all the lab and separation techniques that you're going to want to know for the MCAT, but they're not all high yield. So I've kind of separated them up into high yield and lower yield, and I'll be going over the high yield ones in the videos. So our high yield ones are going to be IR spectroscopy, gel electrophoresis, and column chromatography, and our low Lower yield ones are going to be mass spec, NMR, blotting, and UV spec. I still recommend that you know the low yield ones. I would say even like the low yield ones, like blotting and UV spec is not uncommonly tested. It, I would say they're more like mid yield or something. What you need to know about the lower yield ones is that mass spec separates things based on their mass to charge ratio. NMR is all about protons and sometimes it gets brought up because like MRI machines that we use in medicine are just big NMRs. So there's kind of like a connection with medicine there and they kind of like testing, they kind of like having passages on that kind of stuff, but it's not commonly like tested in the questions. Um, you need to know a little bit about Southern, Western, Northern, Eastern blotting, mainly that these blotting techniques are all used after you run a gel electrophoresis on some molecules. And what they're trying to do is determine the amount of different things in the sample. Okay, that's really vague, but it kind of has to be vague because they are testing for different things. Southern blotting is focused on how much DNA is in the sample. Northern is testing how much RNA. Western is testing how much proteins. And then Eastern, which is never tested, is post-translational modifications to a protein. So I would definitely know like which ones the different blotting techniques are looking for. UV spec is basically shining UV light onto some molecules and seeing kind of their response to it and how much of that UV light is absorbed. And the most important thing to know for UV spec is that your conjugated molecules are going to absorb the most UV spec. So if you ever see something that's like, which one of the following would, would absorb, you know, or have the highest whatever on UV spec, just pick the one that's the most conjugated. And so that has the most double bonds, kind of like every other double bond, you know, like this, this is like a conjugated molecule, but we're going to be looking more at the high yield side. So first I want to talk about IR spec. So IR spec or infrared spectroscopy shoots an electrical field at a molecule and then measures their vibrational frequency. The physics behind it are not near as important as knowing um, just the specific resonance frequency of functional groups. Because what that, you know, the vibration that it picks up from shooting an electrical field at these molecules and kind of the pattern that you get will tell you what functional groups are in your molecule. And so it's really important for characterizing um, molecules that you don't exactly know what they are. Now, maybe in your orgo class, you were given an IR spec and you had to guess what the molecule is. And that's not necessarily how it's going to be tested on the MCAT. The most common way I see it tested is that you are told a specific resonance frequency. Maybe you're shown an actual IR. You're usually not. And you're asked to like pick the molecule that it is, but it's going to be pretty simple usually and straightforward because there's only going to be one that has that specific function functional group. And I think this makes more sense when you kind of get into it. So I pulled this table from our high yield book. These are like the most common functional groups that are tested on the MCAT. This is not at all an exhaustive list, but most likely 90 8% of the functional groups that you see on the MCAT that are tested via IR are going to be these. So we'll start with the highly most common tested one and which is the carbonyl group. So you need to know the resonance frequency of these functional groups and you also need to know um, the characteristics of them or what they actually physically look like. A carbonyl group, which you should know is a C double bonded to an O, is going to have a resonance frequency of around 1700 or I've seen 1720 inverse centimeters and it's going to be a sharp and deep line. Now let's see what that actually looks like. 
This right here is the carbonyl stretch. You can see it's about 1700 or 1720. Those little small differences in estimates are not really going to matter that much, but it's very sharp and very deep. It comes down really far, right? And actually the length that it comes down is based on the polarity of the bond. So C double bonded to an O is a fairly polar bond. And so it's going to be really far down and they are pretty much always going to look exactly like this. They may be a little bit wider, kind of like that, but they're always going to be pretty sharp more like a V and they're always going to be right around the 1700 and they're always going to be deep. So that's carbonyl and that's the most commonly like tested one, most high yield one. I'm going to move um, down to alcohol because I would say this is probably the second most tested one. This is our OH bonds. And so that's a pretty polar bond. So it is going to be, it's not listed here, but it's going to be a deep, deep signature. It's going to be around 3,300, but it's going to be very broad. And this is the important thing about the alcohol groups. This is what it looks like. You can see how different it looks from the carbonyl bond. It is more like a U and it's going, it's around that 33, 3400 mark, and it's going to be very wide. You can see a little bit of these kind of like dips right here, and those aren't like for sure going to be there. Sometimes it's literally just a U. What these are, what these little V's are, are actually like the CH bonds that are kind of just overlapping on onto that alcohol group signature. And so they're going to kind of like you can't separate it out very well. That's why I kind of hate IR, but you know, if you see this deep U on um, an IR, it's definitely going to have an alcohol in the molecule. So moving on to nitriles, which is C triple bonded to a nitrogen. Resonance frequency is going to be about 2250 and it's going to be sharp and deep. So you can see this right here is our nitrile. These are not as high yield, but I would still definitely know them. Very sharp, you know, moderately to pretty dang deep. We're right on that number of 2250. So that's a nitrile. The next one is a carboxylic acid. Now, the important thing about this is what a carboxylic acid actually is, is a carbonyl and an alcohol. And since IR is only looking at one bond, at a time, a carboxylic acid is just going to have the signature of a carbonyl and an alcohol in the same graph. So that's going to look like this. You have this U-shaped um, alcohol signature, and you're going to have that V-shaped deep carbonyl signature in the same molecule. That is the carboxylic acid. The next one is the amine and amides, which are the NH bonds, whether or not there's an O there, which would make it an amide, is actually going to affect the signature a little bit. I know I said that it only focuses on one bond at a time, and so that's true. It is only looking at this N and H, but the O, that really polar atom being there, or that electron dense atom, I guess I should say, is going to affect the signature a little bit. So they're both going to resonate around 3300, which is the same as an alcohol, but they look different. They're both pretty broad, and amine's going to be more shallow, and an amine's going to be more deep, but they look very different from an alcohol. So you can see this is an amide right here. And I know that because the molecules are here. <laughs> so this is an amide. We're looking at the NH bond, but the O right here is going to affect it a little bit. So this is our amide signature right here. They look like W's. Sometimes they have, you know, three peaks or something like that, but they're right around that 3,300. They're relatively broad, you know, when you're compared to something like this carbonyl over here and they're deep because it's an amide. Now, if it was an amine, but it looks the same, it's just more shallow like that. Now something not to get tripped up on is the C to H bonds because those are really common obviously in our organic molecules, a carbon to hydrogen bond. And those are going to be right here and they look darn similar to an amide. But notice these are around 3000. An amide is going to be a little bit higher at about 3300 and that's the way you tell those apart. And pretty much everything like these right here, these are also CH vibrations and they're pretty much going to be in every single IR that you have. See, they're always going to be there. So you can expect around 3000, you're going to have some CH uh, vibrations. So that's IR spec. The most important thing is the resonance frequency and also important is the characteristics and you got to know these functional groups. The next thing I want to talk about is gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis is a lab separation techniques. It separate uh, molecules based on definitely their size, but sometimes also their charge. It kind of depends. So there's two major types. There is native gel electrophoresis. That's going to be the one that uses both charge and size. And then there's SDS PAGE, which stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And what you do in SDS PAGE is that you coat the molecules in a completely negative charge. And so everything in the mix has a negative charge. And so the charge does not matter. You've just eliminated the difference in charge that we could use to separate. All you care about is the size. It's also important to note that SDS PAGE denatures like the molecule that you're looking at, like if it's a protein. So anyway, 
You're just looking at size. That's all you care about with SDS page, size. And that's like literally like size in Dalton's. So how do you do a gel electrophoresis? Okay, so this is all the polyacrylamide gel. That's in all the gel electrophoresis, not just SDS page. And then you have these wells of all these different molecules that, you know, this is just a, a mixture of all this different stuff. You put them in these wells over here and then you run a current through this power source. And I'm drawing it this this way because that's the way that the electrons are running, but we should all know that unfortunately the convention is that current goes the opposite way because they thought it was protons moving a long time ago whenever, you know, we made this stuff up. Now, something that always confused me about SDS page or um, gel electrophoresis in general was why is the cathode negative and the anode positive? And I just looked it up and it's because this battery right here is pumping electrons this direction. So towards the cathode and away from the anode, but the cathode is like actually the positive one because it, it's named after cations and anode is named after anions. So just keep that straight. But the convention for gel electrophoresis is that the cathode is the negative one. So if you are pumping electrons this way and they're going into the gel this way, if anything in these wells is negatively charged, it's going to run away from it, right? That's just the way that electrophysics works. You know, light charges repel. So it's literally going to move slowly through this gel in this direction away from the wells. That's important, away from the wells. And you're going to get something like this. Now, I think the easier one to understand first is the SDS page. So everything, everything in here, right? It's all denatured. It's all negatively charged. So what do we care about? Size. How do these things separate from each other on size? Because if you look at this, these are all different groups of molecules, okay? So it kind of makes common sense. If this is literally like Vaseline up in here, what is going to be able to move the fastest through this thick gel, the smaller molecules, right? So your largest molecules are gonna be closest to the well and the smallest ones are gonna be furthest from the well. That's SDS page. Now, if we are being jerks and we're doing native gel electrophoresis, then the charge matters as well. So the more negatively charged ones are gonna go further down the well because they're trying to run away from that electric current. And the more positively charged ones are gonna stay up here because they don't want to run away that much. In fact, they might even stay in the well if they're like actually legit positive charged. So that's why SDS page is used more often because at that point, like in a native gel electrophoresis, they both contribute to how far it goes down the plate. And so you can't tease apart like, oh, did this one get really far down the plate because it's small or because it's negatively charged? So most of the time they're talking about SDS page. You can also use what's called um, isoelectric point focusing, I think it's called. And that one's kind of cool. And it's like sometimes how they test um, like isoelectric point on the MCAT and what it is is that this gel is like a gradient of pHs and so if you have these charged molecules so you have these charged proteins in your wells and then you run a current through them these proteins are going to move right because they're charged but once they get to their um, you know isoelectric point say this is a pH of you know five or whatever at this point in the gradient once they get to a pH of five and they're at their isoelectric point they no longer have a net charge and so they do not move at all in response to this current so they're gonna stay right there and you can use that to separate proteins because okay well I know that this one stopped at uh, you know 5.1 or whatever so that's the isoelectric point but this one didn't stop until you know 4.6 and so that's that one's isoelectric point so that's a common way that isoelectric point is tested on the MCAT and that is another type of gel electrophoresis so this video is already getting a little bit long and I don't want to make it excessively long um, by putting chromatography in there because chromatography is like got twice the material that I've already said in it I feel like it's easier to watch like two 10 minute videos than one 20 minute video which is really ironic because I constantly make 20 minute videos because I have no self-control and I ramble a ton but anyway, I'm going to make a separate video on chromat chromatography techniques. And then you guys let me know if you want to see a video on uh, research methods so that we could like round this out, this chapter in the high yield book out. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that I made things easier and showed you what was actually that you needed to know on the MCAT for these lab and se separation techniques. Make sure to check out all of our other projects. We have a Discord channel that's like really popping off lately. We have our high yield ebook. We have um, the Anki deck that comes with that. And we have a lot of other projects um, that are super exciting that are coming down the road. So let us know what you want to see. Hit like and subscribe if you want to follow along and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.